Thank you for taking the time to consider this topic with an open mind. In order to comprehend that you're about to see, you'll need to consider that you may have been lied to your entire life by everyone you know, all of them, unwittingly participating in the greatest deception of all time. I fully realize that when you first heard the topic, or possibly even right now, you think that I'm some kind of raving lunatic with an obvious mental problem or some dark ulterior agenda. You probably think that I can be proven wrong with a flick of your finger. I know you're thinking this because a few months ago, a friend of mine mentioned the Flat Earth Conspiracy. And I literally chuckled aloud saying, what an idiot. And me and my friend had a nice little laugh about how gullible these people must be. And honestly, I didn't give the notion a second thought until last week. Last week, I was watching some YouTube videos and decided to have a look at the flat earth conspiracy idiots. To be completely honest, the only reason I looked at it was because of the little chuckle my friend and I had several months ago. If that conversation hadn't taken place, I honestly wouldn't have taken the time to click on the video link that day. Again, that was last week. So, I decided to have a look at what these kooks were ranting on about, so I could destroy their argument with simple common sense in the comments section, and possibly make a video about how retarded these flat earthers were. Probably trying to get attention and steer honest people away from the important topics. I'll tell you that some of the flat earth information could fall into this category, nonsense. However, when I began to look at the flat earth theory, I had all these preconceived notions about falling off the edge and the laws of gravity and the beautiful planets in the night sky and everything else that comes to mind when pondering our world's place in the universe. I thought about theoretical physicists like Einstein, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, that smart guy must be way too busy to debunk this nonsense. When I continued considering the evidence I was looking at, I honestly wrote off any valid points as a strange coincidence that could easily be explained because I knew for a fact that the Earth isn't flat. Now, we need to start from the beginning. When you think of a word or a concept, or if you're pondering or imagining things as most people do when they have a break at work, sometimes at work, your mind's eye is a very literal statement, just like imagine or image in. Your pineal gland has all the same nerves and basic functionality as your real eyeball. The difference between your real eye and your mind's eye is that your pineal gland doesn't use light to base its image rendering, but rather a more obscure source, which is essentially self-generated by you along with the visual experiences you've had related to the topic you may now be pondering in your mind's eye. Now, the advertisers of the world have made it their life's mission and full-time job to take advantage of your mind's eye from as early on as possible. Books, cartoons, documentaries, and of course advertisements are all designed to form associations between certain ideas and images in your mind's eye Advertisers are very good at this, and they're targeting younger and younger people in order to manipulate our collective mind's eye, with the goal of varying degrees of control of what we associate with the picture in our mind. Ultimately, advertisements use very deep psychology to lead us towards buying more of their stuff. And their stuff can be anything from soda pop to the fact that man has set foot on the moon, even played golf on the moon. A quote from Edward Bernays, the father of public relations, AKA propaganda. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed 
our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of political or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public's mind. It's no secret that our tax dollars have funded programs like NASA to the tune of countless billions, probably even trillions of dollars over the decades since NASA was created. If you're not familiar with the Nazi origins of NASA, you can take a quick look at my other video, Flat Earth, the Nazis of NASA in the Infinite Plane. Make no mistake, NASA has had the ability, means, motive, opportunity, and callousness to mold our collective mind's eye into firmly believing in a false picture of our reality. In order for you to understand the information you're going to look at, you'll need to try and suspend your mind's image of the following words, amongst others. Space, 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 gravity, 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 NASA, 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 world, 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 planets, planets, stars, stars, galaxy, galaxy, One concept I'd like you to imagine firmly as possible is a globe spinning at a thousand miles per hour at its equator. However, try not to associate this concept with our world. It might not be possible at this point. I realize you don't have a lot of motivation to research this topic, as a major part of your intelligence is telling you to dismiss what I'm telling you and go on about your business. That's fine if you do, but just know that you are very close to understanding the truth. I'm going to give you an example of how the current accepted model of our world simply does not stack up with reality. I'll try to illustrate the point to the best of my ability, but please make sure to put on your thinking cap. Question, how can a commercial flight, which averages about 500 miles per hour, from New York to LA, have an identical duration with a flight from LA to New York? Assuming, for argument's sake, the Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour eastward, and each plane can travel at 500 miles per hour relative to the ground below, if the Earth is indeed spinning at 1,000 miles per hour to the east, the plane going west could simply hover in place, and the Earth would naturally spin towards it at 1,000 miles per hour. Furthermore, the eastbound flight would have to go a thousand miles per hour just to stand still relative to the spinning earth and would still need to generate another 500 miles per hour beyond the thousand miles per hour mark. And this simply cannot be. Using this logic, in order for the two flights to have identical durations, which is impossible on a spinning globe, the eastbound flight would have to generate enough thrust to propel it 1,500 miles per hour to keep up with the 1,000 miles per hour spin and also overtake that spin by 500 miles per hour relative to the ground below it. Remember, the flights are identical in duration, so on the flight going west from New York, it would have to fly backwards at 500 miles per hour to account for the Earth spinning towards it at 1,000 miles per hour and ensure that the flights have identical duration. If you think about this, logically, a commercial flight going 500 miles per hour could not possibly fly from LA to New York as the destination would continue to get further and further away at a rate of 500 miles per hour. In fact, New York would eventually overtake this flight like an Olympic runner lapping me on the track since he can run twice as fast as me. On the other hand, 
a flight from New York to LA should be very short indeed, as the Earth should be spinning towards that plane at over a thousand miles per hour on top of the 500 miles per hour inherent rate of the plane. This fact alone proves beyond the shadow of any doubt that the Earth is not a spinning globe. Simple logic right in front of our faces and there's absolutely no denying this evidence. Some people don't seem to understand this argument at first and will try to apply false logic to the equation. This is what you're programmed to do and I will try to explain the logic with an analogy then apply the analogy to the flight times conundrum so that you might understand how this equates to verifiable irrefutable proof that our world is not a spinning globe. If you've ever driven down the highway you most certainly know that it's much more difficult to pass a car that's traveling in the same direction as opposed to a car that's coming towards you at 65 miles per hour. The way you figure out how fast a car is going in relation to your car is to add the speeds together. So, if you're doing 65 and the car on the other side of the freeway is also doing 65, your relative difference in speed is going to be 130 miles per hour. Zoom! Now, on the other hand, the car on your right, the grandma doing 64, well, you'll pass by her at one mile per hour since you're doing 65. Since you're both moving in the same direction, we must subtract the two speeds to get your relative difference in speed. So, if the grandma car on your right doing 64 suddenly accelerates to twice your speed, or 130 miles per hour, you're never going to pass grandma as long as you continue doing 65. Keep this in mind. Now, back to the planes. So, the plane leaving New York headed west to LA takes off, and according to the globe model, the plane should actually enjoy a very fast flight to LA as the plane is doing 500 miles per hour, but the destination should also be racing towards the plane at 1,000 miles per hour. So, just like the car on the other side of the freeway, in order to get the relative difference in speed between the two, we add the two speeds, so this equals 1,500 miles per hour. Now, on the return flight, keep in mind, the plane can only do 500 miles per hour. It might keep up with the Earth spinning at 1,000 miles per hour for some short duration, but at some point, the destination would begin to get further and further away at a rate of 500 miles per hour. Now remember, just like the grandma on the highway, we need to subtract the two speeds to figure out the relative difference in speed. So 1,000 miles per hour, the Earth spinning east, and 500 miles per hour, the plane also going east. Since they're traveling in the same direction, the Earth would be going 500 miles per hour faster than the plane. The plane would never catch New York. If you can understand this basic logic, you have just proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that our planet is not spinning. If you can imagine a time not that long ago Scientists were debating the spinning globe theory, which was a relatively new and hotly debated concept. Most of the scientific community laughed in the faces of this new theory, as everyone knew the Earth was not a spinning globe. So, we're in a room with two scientists debating the new globe theory. Based on my calculations, I assert that the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles per hour near the equator. How do you know the Earth is spinning? Well, look at the stars, mate. The Earth must be spinning to cause the apparent movement in the stars. How in the hell can the Earth be spinning at around a thousand miles per hour and we don't just fly off the bloody planet at a thousand miles per hour? Well, here's how it works, mate. Since the Earth is so big, even though space is a vacuum, the Earth sort of pushes away at all the nothingness of space. But the nothing of, of space, like, pushes back. 
So you're trying to tell me that nothing is pushing down upon me with perfect amount of force in order to negate the perfect balance, the weight of the planet pushing up on my feet at a thousand miles per hour? And what are the odds that our planet is spinning in the perfect speed to account for the exact amount of gravity that's pushing down on my feet in perfect balance with the Earth rotating an arbitrary 1,000 miles per hour? Well, I don't know the odds of that happening, but I think the Earth is a globe, so it makes sense to me. So what happens if we get too close to the North Pole? What do you mean? What I mean is, if gravity is pushing down on my head with the perfect amount of force to keep me stuck to the Earth while it's spinning at a thousand miles per hour, then if we get too close to the North Pole, we should be squashed like a bug. What do you mean, squashed like a bug? Well, if the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles per hour at the equator, then say, a hundred feet from the North Pole, it will only be spinning at 1,308 feet per hour. That's about one quarter mile per hour, give or take, so we're talking about a ratio of 4,000 to 1 between the centripetal force at the equator and the centripetal force at the North Pole. No, silly. You don't understand gravity. Gravity is pushing down on the planet evenly at all points. I know that, you twit. But you don't seem to understand centripetal force. The centripetal force generated by the weight of the Earth going 1,000 miles per hour would be 4,000 times less if you're standing 100 feet from the North Pole. If gravity were pushing down with that much force at the North Pole, a 175-pound man at the equator would weigh 700,000 pounds at the North Pole. Right, well, you've never been to the North Pole, but if you did, you would weigh about 700,000 pounds. Actually, people have gone to the North Pole, and were never squashed like a bug. If you can understand this basic flaw in gravity, you have just proved that our world is not a spinning globe. Some people will say, but we've circumnavigated or sailed around the globe. Well, we've sailed around all right, but not around the globe. Most of the people who claim to know that the Earth isn't flat have never considered the true, correct, flat Earth model. Our corporate owners have programmed us to instantly assume, like a knee-jerk reaction, that any person claiming that our world is flat must be some type of raving lunatic with no understanding of science. Your mind's eye will come up with all sorts of factual data to reassure yourself that our world is a globe spinning around the sun in the Milky Way galaxy hurling through space. Believe me when I tell you the person in this conversation with major delusions is the one who believes our world is a globe hurling through space. I'm not calling you crazy, but you have been fooled. The North Pole certainly attracts a compass needle towards the north. However, if you look at the flat Earth model, you'll realize that you can sail around in a giant flat circle, keep the needle pointed to the right, and simply head west. You'll see the false globe model has cleverly taken control of how you view the world, so at this point it still may be difficult for you to understand what I'm telling you, but it is the honest, verifiable, 100% truth. The painful truth is, without considering for a moment that our world is not a spinning globe, you will never be able to review the real facts and subsequently weigh them logically in both models. This means you cannot come to a rational, logical conclusion until you consider that you have been lied to. I can attest to you that in the last week, I have taken the time to consider both models and have come to the definite, doubtless, indisputable conclusion that the globe is a hoax. There are lots of problems that people need to understand in their own personal mind's eye in order to know for certain that I'm not just pulling your leg or that the alternate correct model actually works. I'm going to try and cover a couple of arguments that I've heard people try to use in order to perpetuate or justify the globe image in their mind's eye. When they do this, people are really just trying to understand how the flat earth model works. And I can tell you that I've studied both models and can assert, again, with full certainty that the flat earth model is perfectly sound and logical and answers 
all of the questions left hanging around with the globe theory. I should tell you, nothing in your life is going to change when you do finally realize the truth. Ships are not going to start falling off the edge of the earth if they go too far, and your GPS is still going to work. The only thing that might change in your life at first, if you're like me, you might sleep a little better at night, knowing deep down inside that the planet you're on is completely stationary, just as it seems, and all the celestial bodies we can see in the night sky are rotating around the magnetic center, also known as the North Pole, just as they seem. The celestial bodies are just as beautiful and mysterious as ever. If you're into aliens, don't worry. It's far more likely that our visitors with the magnificent crafts we've been seeing all over the place are most likely our very close neighbors, not just some theoretical fantasy that involves traveling for millions of years through the vast emptiness of space and then somehow finding our little speck of a planet in the dark alley of our average Milky Way galaxy. There are some people whose lives will change because of this, and those would definitely be the science professors and the people at NASA who have tied up their entire lives in the false globe model. If you are a science professor or an independent scientific researcher and you happen to stumble across this topic, you need to grow some balls and get this topic into the mainstream. One of the questions I get a lot is, but we orbit the sun. Wrong. The sun and the moon and all the celestial bodies are actually orbiting the magnetic center, which is found at the North Pole, the center of the possibly infinite plane. The flat Earth model perfectly explains the seasons as the radius of the sun's orbit around the center alternately gets tighter and looser, causing the sun to shine on different areas of the flat Earth at different strengths depending on the time of the year. Another question is, but I can see the curve of the Earth from a plane. Well, many airplanes use curved glass or fisheye glass in the airplane window. Lots of cameras used for extreme condition shooting will also use fisheye lenses. This makes straight lines appear to be curved. Uh, furthermore, the straight line will appear to curve in all sorts of different directions as the camera changes point of view relative to the straight line. If you've been in a plane without curved fisheye glass and you still believe you saw a curve, it truly is an optical illusion wherein your own brain is falsely rendering that perfectly flat horizon as a curve, probably having a lot to do with the misinformed mind's eye. If you study the horizon during a flight critically, you'll see that it is indeed actually perfectly flat and level to the eye no matter how far away. Another question is, well, what about the moon landing? What about NASA? Well, I hate to break it to you, but NASA has been pushing terrible lies into the scientific record, as well as our collective consciousness. Regular people and scientists without rocket ships and unlimited budgets cannot verify or discredit NASA's facts. In reality, if you trust NASA, you would inherently have no reason to argue with the facts or conclusions that they assert, especially if you're a scientist relying on your reputation to make a living or if you're studying trying to pass an exam. Just because you read something in a textbook doesn't necessarily mean that the person who wrote the textbook had any viable grasp on the true place we have in the universe. If you study the footage of the moon landing, there are major problems with the authenticity of the footage, which is absolute proof that the moon landings were a hoax shot in a studio, probably directed by Stanley Kubrick. The International Space Station is no exception. Several people have pointed out air bubbles in space, scuba tanks, snorkels, and even a near drowning during a spacewalk on the space station. International Space Station in the Space Shuttle Atlantis currently orbiting 215 statute miles above the Pacific Ocean. Okay, Danny, you can retrieve the crew lock bag that JR left out there. Good copy that. Good work. 
the International Space Station in the Spatial Atlantis currently orbiting 215 statute miles above the Pacific Ocean. Okay, Danny, you can retrieve the crew lock bag that JR left out there. Copy that. CGI has improved a great deal in the last few years, and it turns out all of the International Space Station, spacewalks, all of that stuff were contrived and most likely filmed in a large water tank right here on Earth. The interviews with the ISS astronauts include blooper reels, which prove they are either suspended with strings or they're simply using a blue screen to fake the footage. NASA has enjoyed unlimited budget and all the full co cooperation of the mainstream media in order to pull off the single greatest deception in the history of the world, not to mention the most expensive. Our tax dollars have footed the bill for this pack of liars to the tune of hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars. Did you know that there are entire websites dedicated to complaining that NASA doesn't get enough funding? Rest assured that NASA has taken our wealth, lied to our faces, spoiled our collective understanding of our real place in the universe, and will continue to bleed us dry, pretending to fly around in outer space and plan all these phony missions to the wandering stars known as the planets, and all we get in return is their sweaty jock straps. Now, all the while, if we could simply travel across the natural boundary to our world known as the Antarctic, the true frontier would begin, but not a pointless frontier into outer space, a totally doable, easily obtainable frontier right next door, literally. Now, due to the Antarctic Treaty signed by all world military powers in the 1950s, it is illegal to travel to the Antarctic without the express written permission of said world governments and only for peaceful scientific research under the strict supervision of the military and with major limitations. Right now, it's actually illegal to bring or store any fuel anywhere near the Antarctic. And this treaty isn't up for debate for several decades. I ask each and every one of you to consider the facts and weigh them in both models. If you have any questions about the alternate correct model, I would suggest that you join the International Flat Earth Research Society where you can see tons of verifiable scientific evidence that the globe is a hoax. And we live on a world that is stationary, peaceful, and serene, just as it seems. Sleep well, my friends. One rather laughable claim I hear is that the International Space Station can't be a hoax because I can see it from my house. Well, can you see people inside it from your house? No, there is clearly something up there orbiting. It just happens to be empty and has never been manned. It's just an orbiting tin can. And the fact that it's empty means it won't really be subject to any forces, moving it back and forth. And all the considerations I mentioned with people like Chris Hadfield going through the station at breakneck speed aren't a problem. So it's very possible to have an empty orbiting tin can, which is what the International Space Station is. And they have some cameras mounted up there as well to do some of the shots supposedly looking down from it. Another aspect of the illusion of space travel is space walks. These are faked inside a swimming pool. It's a custom-built swimming pool, and that's a great way to fake zero gravity. So they now wear snorkels to make sure that they don't drown in space. How can this be happening? A snorkel in space? There could be some water in the porous plate sublimator. When they were on the moon, they supposedly had a, about a gallon of water, but that cooling system is supposed to be well away from their head. There really is no sane explanation for why a gallon of water would leak into someone's spacesuit. 
unless you realise the whole thing is faked inside a swimming pool. In this scene, you can see the Chinese spacewalk and you can see a bubble coming up from the guy's suit. How do you have a bubble in space? Space is supposed to be a vacuum, not a swimming pool, but it's obviously just a swimming pool filled with water. Obviously, there would be some equipment that they could only fix from the outside, but a lot of these spacewalks, it seems like equipment they easily could have configured to be accessible from the inside of the International Space Station. It seems more like an excuse to get out and show their other space trick, which is the faking of spacewalks in a swimming pool. In this vid, you catch a glimpse of someone wearing a scuba tank. Scuba tanks in space? Snorkels and scuba tanks in space? They act like a spacewalk is just a walk in the park, like there's very little danger involved at all. They're looking through the spacesuits. Oh, <laughs> here's a spacesuit. We're going to go for a spacewalk. As if there's no danger at all. Like they don't care. They don't care. They, they don't act like they're in a life threatening situation, like they could die at any second, even though they can. So you would think to preserve their life, they would want to minimise the amount of space walking that they did. But there seems to be an abundance of equipment on the outside of the International Space Station that constantly requires repairing, which makes for a good TV spectacle and is inspired by movies like Sandra Bullock's Gravity. And after Gravity came out, they, of course, had to do another spacewalk to fix some emergency, some piece of equipment that their lives depend on that, amazingly, they can fix every time. But you know what? Thanks to the genius of the engineers at NASA, they employ snorkels in space now, so that should stop them from drowning. It seems mandatory to smile if you're on the International Space Station. I guess when you're doing a hoax, you have to have a big smile plastered on your face because that's what distracts people. Now check this video out. The whole video is about a minute long. I said 45 seconds before was the maximum for full motion mode. It may be more like a minute that they can do this full motion zero gravity mode because then the airplane finishes its parabolic trajectory. It has to dip down for a short period of time. There's double the gravity. Anyway, have a look at the end of this and there's a strange motion to the Santa. Take a look at the way it moves. It kind of skips out of control, out of her control a couple of times. First it dips down and then up a little bit and then at the end it goes up a little bit and she kind of looks a bit embarrassed like she's been caught putting her hands in the cookie jar. Oops, I hope you didn't see that. No, we didn't see, Katie. Just keep the beautiful smile on your face and that'll distract us from the hoax. They supposedly urinate into these funnels. How do they keep it clean? How do they stop it from being encrusted with dried urine? You can't use water to clean it. You could, but you'd be wasting a precious resource and then there'd be dirty urine-filled water floating around the cabin instead of ordinary water. So to summarise, they're living with their own excrement, their faeces and their urine. They build the International Space Station out of long, thin segments. There's all kinds of motions being translated to the International Space Station through these blue handles everywhere. They could spring a leak between segments easily. There's no airlock between segments. They don't do laundry or have showers and they're incredibly uncomfortable the whole time. They don't have access to proper medical treatment or facilities. They have to routinely go outside to fix equipment because they like to put stuff on the outside of the International Space Station that can only be fixed from the outside. So in short, this International Space Station is a suicidal hellhole. It's an awful place to visit. Every second their life is in danger and they could easily die, yet nothing ever goes wrong that they can't easily cope with and fix given the incredibly limited set of tools they must have up there. And they act like they don't care. The International Space Station is the worst place in the world to be and yet they act like it's the best place you could be. When they're supposedly in the International Space Station, I suspect they're actually in the astronaut facility Star City Moscow. There's a specially built training facility. There have been very few civilians in space. One of them is a South African millionaire. 
he had to do several months of training in Star City, Moscow. And what you do is you learn the zero gravity tricks. That's what the training is for. They will tell you, oh, it's training to handle contingencies on the International Space Station. And if someone gets sick, you know, you have to get in the Soyuz and quickly hurry back to Earth. Or if you have to do a spacewalk. <laughs> they have to hide in Star City, Moscow. Because if they're photographed anywhere, it would ruin the whole hoax. They have to stay very hidden. In fact, they basically have to live in Star City, Moscow, as they would do on the International Space